start with mechanical engineering. Remember always that there are 10 questions and in this 10 questions, question number 1 to 5 have one mark each. This is the tradition. 1 to 5 have one mark each and 6 to 10 have two marks each. This is the tradition of the general ability part of gate spans across all streams. So the first five questions will have one mark each and the next five will have two marks each. So that is total five marks. Here there is total 10 marks and a total of 15 marks for the general ability section. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, all of you who are there, one of the best ways of approach is to start that gate paper with this general ability part. And in 10 to 12 minutes, try to take those 15 marks in your pocket. This is the best way of approach. So because of this 15 marks, see your ranking will go around approximately 15 into 1200. That's the approximate average. So you see this valuation is somewhere around uh, 18,000. So your ranking will already be 18,000 above the others who, if they have started with their core topic, might have just been able to do one sum or the maximum cases, none in the first 10 to 12 minutes. So that is a serious start, a very good start. So that's how general ability should be tackled. Let us move on. The first question. This is a one mark question. This belongs to verbal ability. Verbal ability where you see analogies, that means antonyms, synonyms, etc. These are dealt with. <coughs> Excuse me. So if arrow denotes increasing order of intensity, then the meaning of the words smile, arrow, giggle, arrow, laugh is analogous. That means antonym arrow, blank, arrow, shide. Which of the given options is appropriate to fill in the blanks? Now disapprove means express a different opinion, express an adverse opinion. That's called disapproval. Okay. So it's the least uh, intense. Now shide means scolding. The meaning of the word shide is scolding. So that's the most intense one. And in between, let us find out which of the words will fit in. See, grieve means having grief of, uh, lament the loss, you know, I grieved over my father's dead body. So that's it. Reprise, its meaning is, uh, I mean, you know, take action against. Praise, I mean, and in no way connected to disapproval and anything. Praise is actually the opposite. Praising is the opposite of disapproval. It's approval actually. Now, reprove. Reprove means criticize in a negative fashion. So, where a disapproval means expressing a different opinion and shied means downright scolding, reprove is the word which is found to be somewhere in between them, is less in intensity to shied and more in intensity to disapprove. Hence, the correct option will be reproof. Let us move on to the next. Find the odd one out in the set. And in the set, the elements are 19, 37, 21, 17, 23, 29, 31, and 11. Now, if we notice all these elements, we find 
that 19 is a prime number, 37 is a prime number, 17 is a prime number, 23 is a prime number, 29 is a prime number, 31 is a prime number, 11 is a prime number. Prime number is a number which is divisible only by one or itself. Means it has only two factors. But then 21, if you notice, is a number which has more than two factors. And it is hence composite, not a prime number. So 21 is the odd one out amongst the rest. And hence our correct answer is E. 21. This is also a one mark question. The first five will be one mark. This question falls under basic finding the odd one out amongst logical reasoning. Very difficult to pinpoint exactly which grade they fall on, but tentatively that's logical reasoning. Let's move on to the next. In the following series, Identify the number that needs to be changed to form the Fibonacci series. Quite naturally, this sum comes from the topic of series and sequences of modern mathematics. This carries one mark and I am sure everybody understands what a Fibonacci series is. Very common for any stream of engineering. Say suppose we have started with say suppose uh, 0 and 3. Then the next number would be 0 plus 3 that is 3. The next number would be 3 plus 3 that is 6. The next number would be 3 plus 6 that is 9 and so on and so forth. So it's the summation of the previous two numbers. That's a Fibonacci series. Now, Fibonacci series here has started with 1 and 1. So, obviously, the next number would be 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, which is absolutely correct. The next number would be 1 plus 2, which is equal to 3. Absolutely correct. The next number would be 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. We notice an anomaly here, but then let us check. Let us assume that this is 5. Then the next number should be 3 plus 5, that is 8, which makes it correct. 8 plus, uh, rather 5 plus 8 is equal to 13 and so on. So, the number that needs to be changed to form the correct Fibonacci series is 6. So, it will be option number C. Let us move on to the next. The real variables x, y and z and the real constants p, q and r satisfy this following relation. x by p, q minus r square is equal to y by q, r minus p square is equal to z by rp minus q square. Given that the denominators are non-zero, which it has to be, because if the denominators were zero, then the whole fraction would become undefined. The value of px plus qy plus rz is what? That has been asked for. This is a problem carrying one mark. Question number four, it appears. Yes, question number four. And this comes from the topic, arithmetic topic of ratio proportion. Okay, let us solve it. Now I am sure all of us know the shortcut called addendo. It says that if A by B is equal to C by D, is equal to say suppose um, e by f then we can say by the process of addendo that all of these individually will be equal to a plus c plus e divided by b plus d plus f so this is a very important thing here 
let us see but before we go on to do addendo see we have been asked to find the value of px plus qy plus rz now here in the numerator there is only x only y and only z in no other case x and p y and q and z and r are combined together so what we do as the first step is very simple and logical we we say that then px divided by p into pq minus r squared we multiply p on both sides of the first fraction must be equal to we multiply q on both sides of the second fraction qy divided by q into q r minus p square and likewise we multiply r with both the sides of the third fraction so that must be r z divided by r r p minus q square okay now our requisite px qy and rz are obtained we can say and let us suppose this whole thing is equivalent to a constant k then we can say that k must be equal to these three things because we have multiplied it with the same quantity on both sides so it remains the origin from there we can say by applying this process of addendo which we just saw that k is equal to px plus qy plus rz divided by now you see if we put p inside the bracket it becomes p square q minus pr square if we put q inside the bracket it becomes q square r minus q p square and you see that will also be added these two will also be added so will be the third so if you put r inside the bracket it becomes r square p minus r q square okay if we notice carefully that this bottom see p square q but rather before we do that let us write this that k into this denominator i am not writing this denominator again this is a pretty lengthy one k into denominator must be equal to px plus qy plus rz now what is this denominator if we notice carefully see there is a p square q and there is a minus p square q so obviously they cancel each other see there is a q square r and there is a minus r q square which is the same thing so this is the minus sign so obviously they will cancel each other and you see this is a r square p and this is a minus p r square same thing they cancel each other or we can say after this statement that k into 0 is equal to px plus qy plus rz k into 0 will always be 0 so the value of px plus qy plus rz will be option number k zero. good evening to all of you who are there Good evening, Yogita. Let us move on. This is the fifth sum is of one mark. Let us see what it has for us. Take two long dice, rectangular parallelopiped, 
rectangular parallelopiped is something of this sort. It would look somewhat like this. This actually is the original form of dice. Dice. Uh, if you have uh, uh, read the Mahabharata or seen the serials, you will see at that point of time, whenever they played games like this, their dice used to be like rectangular parallelopipeds. So this is the original die. Our Ludo dice came later, I presume. So these dice are rectangular parallelopipeds, as they have said. Each having four rectangular faces labeled as 2, 3, 5, and 7. If thrown, the long dice cannot land on the square faces. So I shouldn't have cancelled the diagram. The diagram is important to understand that. See, because of it is a rectangular parallelopiped, it is like this. So the die cannot land on this square face. Okay. It's impossible. So actually, there are four faces which are, uh, I mean, you know, being taking part in the game. And say, suppose the four faces are two, this face is three. The bottom one is say 5 and the back one is say 7. And has one fourth probability of landing on any of the four rectangular faces. So it's a fair die and the probability of landing on any one of the faces is 1 by 4. The level on the top face of the dice is the score of the throw. So in this example, this is the score of the throw. Here 2 has been thrown because as you see 2 is the topmost face. Now there are two dice. If thrown together, what is the probability of getting the sum of the two long dice scores greater than 11? Two long dice scores means the scores on the top base. The summation is greater than 11. Is greater than 11. That's what they have said. Let us see. In any problem, as you can see, this is a problem of probability, modern mathematics. Now, in any probability, we know that the probability of an occurrence in an event is always the ratio of the favorable outcomes divided by the total possible outcomes. Total possible outcomes. But then we can also think it in this fashion that you see since the probability of landing on any one of the faces is 1 by 4. So the total possible outcome of the first die is 4. And the second die is also 4. And hence both the die taken simultaneously will follow the rule of multiplication. That is 16 is nothing but the total possible outcome. Okay. Now for the favorable outcome. How can the two top parts of the die show greater than 11? Very simple. The first die can show 5. The second can show 7. Let us not forget that these are the only possibilities of the die. It can also be the reverse. The first die showed 7 and the second showed 5. And then there is also another case. Both of the die showed 7. So three possibilities, three favorable outcomes are there. So obviously the favorable outcome is 3. Hence the probability of getting the sum of the two long dice scores greater than 11 will be nothing but 
favorable outcome divided by total outcome which is 3 by 16. So option number D is the correct one. Let us move on. This is question number 6. It will obviously have 2 marks. And as you can see that this is a verbal ability question with its roots in grammar. Okay. So this is testing your grammatical skills, grammatical application skills. Let us see. In the given text, the blanks are numbered from 1 to 4. Select the best match for all the blanks. The first sentence is Professor P, blank 1, merely a man who narrated funny stories. Full stop. The second st sentence starts with blank 2. In his blackest moments, he was capable of self-depreciating humor. Now self-depreciating humor means humor wherein he criticizes or makes fun of himself. Okay. Blackest moments means worse moments. He is, if nothing is going well. Okay. But still, Professor P was capable of, I mean, creating humor by, I mean, you know, utilizing himself, by criticizing himself or making fun of himself. So here, the most correct fit would be, see, Professor P wasn't merely a man who narrated funny stories. Was merely is not the right application. Professor P wasn't merely a man who narrated funny stories. Even in his blackest moments, he was capable of self-depreciating humor. So it would be Professor P wasn't merely a man who narrated funny stories. Even in his blackest moments, he was capable of self-depreciating humor. Next, Professor Q, blank 3, a man who hardly narrated funny stories. So obviously this would be Professor Q, was a man who hardly narrated funny stories. Next sentence. Blank 4, in his blackest moments, was he able to find humor? So, only in his blackest moments was he able to find humor because he hardly narrated funny stories. So, only in his blackest moments was he able to find humor. So, the blanks would be in the order of wasn't, even, was, only. Wasn't, no, so only wasn't are these, let us find out. Wasn't only, no, ours is wasn't even, was only. So this is wrong. So wasn't even, was, ah, this is the right option. Option number B is the right option. Let us move. This is the seventh question, carries two marks. How many combinations of non-null sets ABC are possible from the subsets of 235? The elements are 235. Satisfying the conditions, number one, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Okay, let us see. This is uh, uh, from the topic of modern mathematics, set theory, Venn diagram and set theory. How many combinations of non-null sets ABC are possible from the subsets of 2, 3, 5? So see, we know that if a set has n elements, then the number of non, then the number of subsets that can be formed would always be 2 to the power n subsets. 
but any one of this subset has to be a null set. So we can say that the number of non-null subsets for a set with n elements would always be 2 to the power n minus 1. This is the fundamental. Now see here, the set is 2, 3, 5. That is, it has 3 elements. So the number of, let us suppose this is A actually. A is this. Then the number of non-null subsets would be equal to 2 to the power 3 minus 1. That is 7. Number of non-null subsets is 2 to the power 3 minus 1. That is 7. Now, what are the subsets of A? Because B has to be a subset of A. So, the subsets of 2, 3, 5 can be C. 2, 3. 2, 5. 3, 5. Okay. These are the basic, I mean, you know, non-null sets that are possible from this by selecting any two at a time, 3C1. So, what is the number of non-null subset of this? It would be 2 to the power 2 minus 1. Same, this would also be 2 to the power 2 minus 1. And this would also be 2 to the power 2 minus 1. Now, another these are the B's. Now, another type of subsets can also be created. See, the subset containing only one element, they can be quite a lot. All these three, right? So, how many subsets does this have? This would have non-null subsets is equal to 2 to the power 1 minus 1, that is 1. How many would this have? Non-null subsets is equal to 2 to the power 1 minus 1, that is 1. And this also would have non-null subsets is equal to 2 to the power 1 minus 1 is equal to 1. So what are the number of combinations of non-null sets possible? where A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C. Achha, I made this in the reverse order. This would be C. This obviously remains B and this is C. Okay? Because uh, the initial that I took, it became B is a subset of A and C is a subset of B. It's the reverse. So, just change the name. So, what are the number of possibilities C? Here there are 7, so you are going to say that the number of combinations, the number of combinations possible would be given by 7 into, take 3 out of the 3, take 3 elements out of the 3, taking 3 elements out of the 3, plus C, this is 3 into, because see, this is 2 to the power 2 minus 1 is equal to 3. This is also 3. This is equal to 3. So this is 3 into 3, 3C2. Three you have taken 3C2, right? I mean, basically this C, 3C3 is you have selected 3 elements out of all the 3. That's exactly how we did it. This 3C2 is you have selected two elements out of the three. That's how sets B turned up. And this would be, see, one has come up. One into three. C, one. You have taken any one out of them. Okay. So that would be equal to seven into uh, one. Uh, seven into one. That is seven. Plus this would be. 
3 into 3 that is 9 and this would be 1 into 3 that is 3 so 7 and 9 that is 16 16 plus 3 is 90 so 19 would be the total possible answers uh, ah there is 90 there is 90 i hope it is understood hope this is understood let us move on. This is uh, question number, question number, the last one was question number uh, seven. Yes, question number seven. So this must be question number eight. Carries two marks. As can be very clearly seen is a data interpretation question based on bar graphs. Let us observe. Uh, here it is written batting average. The numbers have turned a bit hazy due to magnifying. But then it is 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So a gap of 20. And these are the calendar years 2012 every year till 2022. So 10. Okay, let us read. The bar chart gives the batting averages of VK and RS for 11 calendar years from 2012 to 2022. Out of which VK is the grey one, RS is the, I mean, you know that dotted type one, not dotted exactly, this squared one. Okay. Considering that 2015 and 2019 are World Cup years. So this is the World Cup year. This is the World Cup year. Which of the following options is true? Let us see. RS has a higher yearly batting average than that of BVK in every World Cup year. I will say this is true in this case. In this case, this is true. But in this case, it is not so. RS doesn't have a higher batting average because this is the batting average graph. So this is a false statement. Next, VK has a higher yearly batting average than that of RS in every World Cup year. Uh, as you can see, it is not so here. So clearly it can be understood that this is wrong. Third, Vicky's yearly batting average is consistently higher than that of RS between the two World Cup years. Between the two World Cup years means these three years. So VK is more, VK is more, VK is more. This is the correct sentence. VK's yearly batting average is consistently higher than that of RS between two World Cup years. And just let us check the fourth. Even though in the exam hall, once we have reached this, we would stop there and go on to the next question. But let us do it. RS's yearly batting average is consistently higher than that of VK in the last three years. So the last three years are this. It is higher, it is higher, but it is not higher here. So this is a false statement. So option number C is the correct one. Let's move on. This is the ninth question. As you can see, this is uh, regarding paper folding and absolute logical reasoning based questions. Let us see what has been said. This carries two marks, by the way. A planar rectangular paper has two V-shaped pieces attached at shown, as shown. Okay, so this is the rectangular paper. This whole stuff, let us name it A, B, C, and D. This is the rectangular paper. And I am sure you can understand what is that. What are the two V-shaped structures that are attached? 
this piece of paper is folded to make the following closed three dimensional object closed means no part is vacant that is you cannot see this it's a completely filled up structure number of folds required to form the above object would be how much okay we would say that the first fold would be let us select a different color of ink we can say that the first fold would be here and here so as to make the v stand alongside see this v you are pressing below this v also you are pressing below so that they become parallel to the rectangular strip of paper okay you are pushing it on the inside inside of the screen so now what remains is just this rectangle because these v-shaped ones are now like this they are now like this attached okay now the second thing that we should be doing is since there is a folding see this ad is this this is our ad now we have to make a fold along say pq PQ are these two points. We must make a fold along that point. This fold must also be there. Mind it, already one, two, and now the third fold is being applied. So once PQ, PQ will become this one, P and this one is Q. That is PQ. Folded it down, folded it such that this comes parallel to this. Then there must be another fold. Uh, we can approximately say that it would be somewhere here because this will go this way. So somewhere around here. Two folds actually to coincide with this. To coincide with this particular stuff. Actually not this. Actually to coincide with this. So that means you have applied fold number 4 and fold number 5. Very difficult to express, but I hope you are understand. Now we have completed till this part. We have completed till this part. Now one needs to go to the topmost till topmost another length. So that would be this. This is fold number 6. But then again another small one that is fold number 7 to compensate for this so let us suppose this is uh, m n and this is x y then this is m this is n this is x and this is y okay so that is one it goes on but then you have to now move along the outer edge you just now did along the inner edge now you have to move on the outer edge so outer edge you have moved till say this let this be alpha point alpha so you have moved till alpha then let this point be beta so you will have to compensate for that with a beta by the way in x was six and seven i one two three four five six seven eight nine so eight and nine are completed till beta is nine and then there is no other fold required, I presume, because this comes directly here. So BC will touch at this point. So this is AD, this also becomes B and C. And uh, let us identify here the points. Let us identify them with the help of the points. See, this is MN. So M is this point, N is this point. This is x, y. So x is this corner, y is this corner, the top one, this. Then comes alpha, beta. So this is alpha, this is beta. No, sorry, uh, alpha, beta. Now I haven't placed anything here. So I've just marked it as alpha. So let it remain just alpha. 
and beta is this one. So in total, as we can see, nine folds are required. Let us see whether nine is an option. Okay, this was a pretty uh, complicated one. Looks very complicated actually. So nine would be the answer for this question. Nine folds. I hope we have understood. I mean, let us not confuse ourselves with these names. These names actually will confuse our, us more. But I hope we have understood what we were doing. So forget these names. Let us just concentrate on what we did. I hope you understood. The paper was folded. So nine folds is the answer. Just check it once. Revise it yourself. Let us move on. This I presume is the, yes, this is the 10th question. 10th question carries two marks. Four equilateral triangles are used to form a regular closed three-dimensional object by joining along the edges. What is the angle between any two faces? First of all, this is a problem of mensuration, geometry mensuration. Now, one must remember that if four equilateral triangles are joined, four equilateral triangles are joined along their edges, the structure that is formed is known as a tetrahedron. It's very difficult to draw this tetrahedron. Very, very difficult. Uh, it's, it's a co very complex one, very difficult to draw by hand. Okay. This tetrahedron has a very typical properties. The angle between any two faces of this tetrahedron, which has been asked, is basically a theoretical question. It always is 60 degrees. Whenever four equilateral triangles are joined along their edges, a tetrahedron is formed. A very basic theoretical stuff. And whenever there is a tetrahedron in front of you, always remember that the angle between the faces will always be 60. So that is basically a theoretical question. And the correct option is option number B. And with that, we end our mechanical engineering portion.